Uh, so we're going to pick up here talking about some autonomic driven system agonists and antagonists. So we talked about what these mean kind of just generally earlier. Remember, an agonist is something that can increase the activity at a receptor. It can make the receptors more sensitive and therefore more active. Antagonists do the opposite. Antagonists decrease receptor activity and therefore inhibit a particular receptor. So what we find in here, there's just, it's just a general overview of the different types of agonists and antagonists for a variety of receptor subtype, subtypes. So what we find here then are muscarinic, nicotinic, alpha and beta adrenergic, agonists and antagonists. So this just shows generally the different types of drugs that might uh, uh, work as antagonists for receptors or agonists. So, you know, muscarinic receptors, uh, their agonist is something called muscarin. This is the one that I told you guys was derived from fly agaricus muscle, um, mushroom. And this is what, one that would increase the activity at muscarinic receptors. So what nervous system were the muscarinic receptors associated with? Sympathetic or parasympathetic? Parasympathetic, mostly, but sometimes sympathetic, right? So technically both. But you're right, if it's sympathetic, it's only found in? Good, sweat glands, blood vessels, and uh, skeletal muscle blood vessels, actually. Um, and then what about the muscarinic receptors of the parasympathetic nervous system? Where do you find those? Every organ. Yeah, every organ. So what if you had a muscarinic agonist? Not antagonist, but agonist. So you increase the activity of muscarinic receptors around the body. What's that kind of simulating? What's it like if you increase muscarinic receptor activity? Yeah, uh, not adrenaline, because this is parasympathetic. Yeah, it's like acetylcholine, right? Or it's like you just become very parasympathetically active. So if you gave someone a muscarinic agonist, that's like <coughs> increasing their uh, parasympathetic activity, right? So what would be a very extreme parasympathetic response around your body? Yeah, fainting, right? Blood pressure and blood heart, heart and heart rate gets so low that you lose consciousness. Good. Uh, yeah, I mean you might you might see increase in blood flow to tissues, you know, including the genitals. Yeah. What else we got? Yeah. Or what, what about like an increase in uh, digestive activity, right? So upset, I mean, the GI upset. Good. What about if you had atropine, which is actually a muscarinic antagonist? If you're actually blocking muscarinic receptors, is that increasing or decreasing parasympathetic activity? Decreasing. decreasing, yeah. So what might happen if you blocked muscarinic receptors with atropine? Maybe, yeah, you can inhibit digestion. Yeah, you actually get an a corresponding increase in heart rate. What up in the digestive activity? Yeah, slow down, exactly. How about pupils? They dilate. In fact, uh, that's what they do. You know, if you go get an eye exam, uh, they can give you atropine, which can dilate your pupils. Makes sense. Because if you block the parasympathetic effect on pupillary muscle, it causes pupillary dilation, which is more like a sympathetic effect. Kind of makes sense. Um, and then we have nicotinic receptor agonists and antagonists. Guess what's, a, guess what's an agonist of nicotinic receptors, you guys? Nicotine, yeah, it makes sense. Nicotine actually activates nicotinic receptors. But where do you find nicotinic receptors? Sympathetic nervous system? Parasympathetic nervous system? And the somatic motor system, right? Now, wh where'd you find them in the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems? Where were they located? on the post-ganglionic neurons in both systems, right? So what if you increase the activity of nicotinic receptors? What would, it, what would happen, do you guys think? I know it's weird to think about, right? You're actually increasing the activity of both systems, sympathetic and parasympathetic, because they both use nicotinic receptors. So you'd see general activity, in, an increase in activity in both systems, which is interesting. But it also is found on skeletal muscle. So it actually would also increase the sensitivity of skeletal muscle, which is why a lot of... Um, Athletes, you know, uh, ingest nicotine in some way, right? Uh, they, uh, because they can actually make their muscles more sensitive, right? Like baseball ch players will chew, right? Because they can get the nicotine in their body. 
Now, why would that? How can that make you better at baseball then? Like, if you get nicotine in your bloodstream, and it makes your skeletal muscles more sensitive. Yeah, you maybe it increases re reflex. And if you're trying to hit a fastball, where you have fractions of a second to decide whether to swing or not swing, that might be the difference between making a home run and striking out. So it's actually kind of interesting. But you know, there's obviously uh, negative consequences of that too. Like my hometown, we had Tony Gwynn. He's a famous baseball player, and he just died recently um, from. Uh, oral cancer from using chew his whole career. Uh, in fact, they even put fiberglass in that in that chewing tobacco to break the skin barrier so you can absorb the nicotine better, which is pretty nasty. I know. I don't know what that is. Huh. Um, and you know, then we have alpha and beta agonists and antagonists too, you guys. Don't memorize these drugs, but you know, they're up here for your all for for your information. Now, uh, we know that mo most organs in the body are dually innervated by both systems, parasympathetic and sympathetic. So we said there's some dynamic antagonism here, right? So that each system opposes the effect of the other. So if the sympathetic nervous system does one thing to the heart, then the parasympathetic nervous system does the other, right? And because each organ receives dual input, then, um, you know, then they're going to have different effects on the organ. Now, uh, these actions are caused by both divisions, can be antagonistic. It can be sometimes cooperative, too. Now, most of the time, they're, <coughs> they're antagonistic. And what we find, you guys, is that uh, we can be at extremes, right? But under normal conditions, we, we don't really exist at a sympathetic extreme long-term or a parasympathetic extreme long-term, right? Like, imagine if you're extremely sympathetically active chronically. And you'd find that with, like, PTSD, right, post-traumatic stress uh, disorder. You know, they, they have difficulty calming down, and they're always sort of on edge uh, from some sort of prior trauma. And that would be an excessive sympathetic response, chronically, right? But, you know, under normal circumstances, you will only become severely or, uh, you know, highly sympathetically active under extreme circumstances. Like if you're running away from a big old green snake, right? <laughs> or uh, decided you're going to fight that mountain lion rather than run from it. Okay? I know. It sounds like a great idea. <laughs> Or, you know, the other extreme here would be if you're extremely parasympathetically active, well, that's like consistent with sleep, right? But there's a lot that has to happen for you to sleep. So, you know, if you're awake and under normal circumstances, you guys, we're going to exist somewhere in the middle between extremes of parasympathetic and sympathetic responses. Now, what's interesting, too, is that we also have these autonomic reflexes. An autonomic reflex is like other reflexes we talked about. It's basically a, 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 a stereotyped and rapid response to some sort of stimulus that always occurs the same way. So an example of an autonomic reflex would be like, if your blood pressure is too low, that causes an increase in heart rate. Or if your blood pressure is too high, it causes a decrease in heart rate. Okay? Those are autonomic reflexes. And so these reflexes, though, don't require higher brain centers. They can occur through the spinal cord or through the brainstem. And they just, they're just going to work like a normal reflex loop, just like the patellar tendon reflex. Remember, you, you tap the patellar tendon, what happens next? Leg takes out. What about for your heart? Blood pressure gets low, heart rate goes up, so you can increase your blood pressure. So it's kind of interesting. So uh, these autonomic reflexes are, are going to uh, help and with smooth muscle contractions, cardiac muscle contractions, even glandular secretions to some sort of stimulus. So we do have secretions due to stimuli, which is a reflex. And you don't have to think about these occurring, hence the name reflex. Now, there are some conditions where these reflexes don't work normally. We have autonomic dysreflexia. And we'll talk more about this when we get to pathophysiology, but it's a life-threatening condition that's common in, in quadriplegics or even just individuals with uh, spinal cord injury. You know somebody? Yeah, we'll, we'll share that story later. Uh, so for the autonomic reflexes, guys, what this picture shows is, uh, you know, you get sensory input, let's say for the urinary bladder. Our urinary bladder can sense stretch. That information is sent back towards the spinal cord where then uh, it communicates with an interneuron. That interneuron excites a motor neuron that then goes back to the urinary bladder and causes the smooth muscle of that urinary bladder to contract. Now, do you guys think this is a sympathetic or parasympathetic reflex if it's causing you to urinate? Parasympathetic. You got it. And it makes sense, you guys, because um, this would be parasympathetic neuron in the sacral spinal nerves. And then when it goes to the, to the organ here, we have intermural uh, axons, which the ganglia is actually inside the wall of the organ. And it causes the smooth muscle to contract, which then causes you to urinate. So the reflex here is your bladder fills with enough stretch that causes a reflex where the bladder then contracts. 
So due to overstretch of the bladder, the bladder muscle then will contract to expel that urine. But is this the only way that you can urinate? It can't be, right? We know that this can't be the case for everything. We know that it's, there's more to this than just, oh, my bladder's full, and then uncontrollably peeing, right? There's more to it. Like, we can somehow control our process of urination, but we can't control this reflex. What we can control are nearby sphincters, and other sphincters can be made of skeletal muscle, and you can, you can actually contract those very strongly, where even though the bladder might be contracting, by contracting a skeletal muscle sphincter consciously, you can prevent abnormal or uh, inappropriate urination, right? But you won't be able to control that bladder contraction. In fact, if you ever you know, urinate so bad, you can kind of like feel it, like you can feel the bladder contracting. It's you know it's concerning. I've been I've been in, I've been in traffic on I twenty five once, and there's no emergency lane, and I'm thinking, what am I gonna do? I am so much, I'm just I'm in trouble, right? And I was freaking out. I'm like sweating, you know, and <laughs> I made it though. Luckily, I made it, you guys. I didn't think I had it in me, but I did. I made it. It was good. But try, trying to resist a reflex is pretty challenging, and so it's interesting. Um, now, you might wonder, well, uh, if, the, if the autonomic nervous system is involved with regulating homeostasis, it probably involves more than just your spinal cord and brainstem, and that will be true. So there are some higher brain centers of, in control of autonomic function. We have areas like the cerebrum, the hypothalamus, the brainstem, and spinal cord. All of these parts of the central nervous system are involved with uh, controlling your autonomic nervous system. So the cerebrum is involved with conscious activities that affect the hypothalamus and control the ANS. So the example of this, you guys, would be like, if your blood pressure is high, you can change your emotional state, which changes the emotional responses, I'm sorry, the visceral responses to emotion, which is a hypothalamic function. So let's say if your blood pressure is high and you start to relax, that could actually help to decrease your heart rate by making you more parasympathetically active. That way you can actually kind of slow down your heart rate and become more relaxed, which can decrease your blood pressure, right? But it's not under conscious control because you're indirectly controlling the, the ANS. Now, the hypothalamus helps to integrate uh, information. It functions as the command center for autonomic functions, and there, it's also going to be the ones that are involved with emotional responses. So we know that these extremes are very emotional. Like if you say you're sympathetically active or parasympathetically active, there are emotional qualities to both of those states, right? The emotions can vary. But there are emotions that are consistent with either. Like if I just threw a word out there, you guys could probably put it into sympathetic or parasympathetic, right? Uh, you can kind of categorize that. Like if I said scared, sympathetic, right? Exactly. Relaxed, parasympathetic. You got it. Yeah. So now what's interesting then is that those emotional qualities are actually due to higher brain centers like the cerebrum. But because the hypothalamus is involved with the visceral responses to emotion, that you actually get an, an autonomic response in response to those emotional qualities. And in that regard, you can kind of indirectly control the autonomic nervous system. And this is why people recommend that you kind of meditate and calm down, you know, if you're stressed. It actually has a, uh, effects on your visceral organs, which is interesting. Now, uh, the brainstem has major ANS reflex centers. And so it's involved with just some different autonomic reflexes, especially the parasympathetic reflexes. And the spinal cord has other ANS reflexes, but these are going to be in ones that are involved with the sympathetic reflexes, um, and as well as other... Uh, parasympathetic reflexes like defecation and urinating.